What's up, family? I pray you are having a wonderful day. I'm so glad that you joined us today. It's going to be a great one. So listen, do me a favor. I want you to share this right now with family and friends right now on social media because it's going to be a life-changing word. Uh, and I believe that God is going to do something phenomenal in our midst today. So listen, I want you to grab your Bibles and we're going to continue our series, Side Effects. Uh, last week, we talked about that bottle of ibuprofen and the side effects that came with it. And sometimes we take things not realizing that it has effects on us in other ways. And so today, what we want to do is actually pinpoint a biblical character by the name of Ruth, who's going to actually uh, kind of give us the the, the lessons and the principles we need today to learn this lesson of how to handle different side effects that are taking place in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your iPads, what I want you to do is I want you to go with me to Ruth chapter one, and we're going to read verses 19 and 20 in your hearing. It says this. Now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them and the women said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I wanna use as a subject, as we deal with this side effect issue, I wanna use as a thought, don't do that to yourself. So many people right now are dealing with mental strain. They're dealing with the stress of what they're seeing mentally in our world. Every day we are bombarded with negative news about things that are happening around our world. And this past week, I actually came across a news article about a woman, about a woman by the name of Lorna Breen. She was 49 years old. She actually worked uh, at the New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital, but she ended up testing positive uh, for the COVID-19 virus. After being uh, tested positive, she went home with her family in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and she committed suicide. The actual police officer said this. He said that the personal protective equipment, the PPE, can reduce the likelihood of being infected, but what they cannot protect heroes like Lorna Breen from is from the emotional and mental devastation caused by this disease. She saw so many things happen in the city of New York while she was serving there, and it played a toll on her mentally. And if we're honest, all of this is playing a toll on us mentally. And so I want to deal for the next few moments with our mental state, dealing with how COVID is affecting us mentally. I asked some of you to fill out a survey, and you did that. And thank you so much for filling out that survey. And if you don't mind, if you haven't, we'll make sure we put it in the link below, or even on our Facebook page, so you can give us information so that we can serve you better. But many of you said that you were having a hard time mentally. And so the Bible talks about how to handle stress. But there's a woman by the name of uh, Naomi, actually, who is dealing with a very difficult time in her life. And the Bible says in chapter one that her husband, Elimelech, actually moved to a place called Moab. When they get there, they get there because of a famine. He's making the best moves he can under the situations that he's in. And many of you are just trying to make the best decision. You're just trying to make the best move with what you have. And I came to encourage you to keep making the decisions. No decision is 100%. Outside of salvation, outside of Jesus, every decision you will ever make will have some kind of negative impact or it just won't have it all. You can find you what you think is the perfect spouse and you realize they're not perfect. You think you found the perfect house, move in and realize it's not the perfect house. You think you can find the perfect car, buy the car and realize it's not the perfect car because it's not 100%. And so the Bible says that Elimelech makes a move to Moab because of a famine. So many people want to deem this as God being angry with us. But it could be actually a natural disaster. The Bible says that there's a famine in Ruth chapter one. It's a famine. It's just a natural disaster. It wasn't that God was angry with them. It's just something happened. And can I tell you, sometimes life just happens. Sometimes it's just life. It's not that God is mad at you. So many people have a theology that the reason why this is happening is because God is mad at you for something you did and this is payback and you're going to pay for what you've done. And I came to tell you, God is not mad at you at all. I came to tell you that he loves you. And even though we're not perfect, he knows that and he loves us in spite of. And so the Bible says that they move because of this disaster. Now, I want to share this with you. The Bible also makes very clear in other situations, like in the book of Judges, where Gideon is actually hiding from the Midianites. 
And the Bible says that the reason why that the Midianites were attacking them is because of their disobedience. Even in Deuteronomy, I believe, chapter 11, the Bible says that if you disobey me, that he will shut up heaven and he will close uh, the rain. So the, the Bible speaks about that, but God makes it clear that when he does it, he says, yes, I'm going to do this. We do not see this in the book of Ruth. This is not something that God did. This is just a natural disaster. And so I want you to know that God is not mad at you. This is just life. And so the Bible says that she goes on, she lives her life. And what she's doing is she loses her husband during this time. She's having to deal with the loss of her husband. And so many of you having to deal with the loss of loved ones because of this virus. Some of you have lost loved ones just during this time, not as a result of COVID-19, but just the loss of just natural causes and other things. But yet you didn't have the opportunity to bury them or you couldn't see them or you couldn't send them off properly or the way you would want. And you're having an issue with that. And I can understand that. But I want you to know that God is still able to heal the heart, even though this situation has caused things to be very difficult for you. It's interesting to see how Naomi responds to this. She not only loses her husband, but she also loses her two sons. And now it's playing her. And the Bible talks about this. The Bible says that the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, there's always a mental battle. There's always something there we're going to fight in our minds. And while you are going through this, I want you to make sure that you don't beat yourself up for the things that you are experiencing. Do the best you can. Watch God work the rest out. I believe he's going to work it out on your behalf. And I need you to stay focused and stay faithful and consistent to what God is giving you to do. I believe he's going to turn this around in our favor because the Bible speaks about that. The Bible says that even as she loses her husband and her sons, that her sons actually end up marrying two women. One Oprah, not Oprah, Oprah, and the other one by the name of Ruth. And the Bible says that after she loses both of her sons, she says this, I'm going back to Bethlehem because I hear God is moving. I want you to know, in spite of all of the negativity that the news puts out, in spite of all of the negativity that people have a tendency to repost, I want you to know God is moving in your midst. I believe he's moving now. I believe he's going to continue to move, and I want you to stay faithful and to continue to believe that God is going to move in your life no matter what's going on. You may not see it, but it doesn't mean he's not moving. Yesterday, uh, actually earlier this week, my, my daughter celebrated her birthday, and so we were uh, getting gifts, and so we had things in the truck. We had a bicycle in the car. We had uh, little honors and princess gifts and all this stuff, and we were working on things and she didn't even see it. Can I tell you, God is getting ready to throw you a party. He's already putting things together that you don't even know about. And I came to let you know that God is still moving on your behalf, even though you don't see it. And the Bible says that when she comes here, she has to deal with something. And so she says to her daughter-in-laws, we have to separate. She has to call it a loss. And I want you to know that sometimes when we're dealing with loss, we have to grieve. And so I want to take a moment right now to talk about the seven stages of grief. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The first uh, stage of grief is shock or disbelief. It is the initial uh, paralysis of hearing the news. You can't believe that that just happened. And so that's just a natural part of just being a part or experiencing the stages of grief. The second stage is denial. This is where people... It's, it's just like, I can't accept it. I can't really believe it. It's like someone gives you bad news and you say, oh, you really don't mean that. You, you'll come back and you'll change your mind on that. And then some people live in denial for a very long time until it becomes what clinical uh, um, psychologists call uh, complicated grief. It is where your grief has become so complicated because you will not leave the stage of denial. Then sometimes people get angry. And while people are getting angry, they become frustrated and they begin to lash out at people because of what's going on. And that is a part of the stage of grief. Then you have bargaining. Now you're trying to seek ways uh, out of what, what's going on. You may look at opportunities to make yourself feel better because you're trying to bargain. Maybe if I do this, I can get something in return and I'll feel better. Then what happens is people begin to test. You know what? I'm in a place where I really got to look at life and try to figure out what I need to do to really make this better for me. And so they begin to try things because they want out. They don't want to live in a state of bitterness until finally they come to a place of acceptance and hope. 
and they finally find a way to move forward. What happens is sometimes even in grieving, we have to find a way to finally accept what has changed because all of us are dealing with grief, all of us, myself included. We are grieving the loss of loved ones. Some of us are grieving the loss of jobs. Some of us are grieving the loss of relationships. Look, all of us, I believe, are grieving from our normal. So now we used to have a schedule Monday through Friday. We went to work. After work, we went to the gym. After gym, we went home, we ate dinner, spent time with family or hung out with friends. The normal of going to weddings. This is a very high peak wedding time and people weddings are being canceled. People are grieving from what we used to know as normal. But you know what? We have to come to a place to accept our new normal. We don't know what the future holds, but we know God has everything uh, uh, and, and under his, his palm and he's moving things forward. And no matter what's happening, we know that God has the best at the end of all of this. And so I believe that the best is yet to come. And I don't want you to beat yourself up, but I can't allow you to not go through the, all the stages of grieving. Don't stop at denial. Don't stop at depression. Don't stop at bargaining. I need you to go all the way through and accept that you know what? God has something new for me. And so the Bible says that she says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. I need you to type in the comments, I'm going back to Bethlehem. The reason why I want you to type that because Bethlehem means this, house of bread. I came to tell you that God is getting ready to position you where you're getting ready to experience worship at a different level. You're going to experience God at a different level. I believe that he's just he's just removing all of the clutter, removing all of the distractions so that we can focus on him. And he's coming to a place that we can recognize that he is the one that sustained us. Give us this day our daily bread. God, speak to us. Move in our lives. I pray that God sends the right people, the right opportunities, the, the, the right uh, uh, doors that will be open for you. I pray that God does all of that for you during this time because God has so much in store for you. It's time for you to get ready to move into a place where you can live in a place where God has provided everything you need. It's a place of worship. Jesus said himself, Moses, when he was in the wilderness and they, they had manna to come from heaven, he said, that was one manna. He said, but I'm the bread of life. Jesus came that we may have a life, that we don't have to look to other things. We don't have to look to drugs. We don't have to look to sex. We don't have to look to relationships. We don't have to look to, to, to food. We don't have to look at addictions. We don't have to look at other things to fill that void. But I believe that Jesus came and his sacrifice allows us to live a fulfilled life. I believe God is positioning us. Listen to me. God is not punishing you. He's pivoting you. He's positioning you. So when you look at this, oh my God, this happened. But look at what's happening. You're changing. You're becoming better. You're clearer. You're stronger. You're wiser. You're thinking more about your future than you ever have. Why? Because this wasn't punishment. God was pivoting you and positioning you for next. And I came to tell you, that when Naomi goes back to her hometown, she goes back to Bethlehem. Everybody, the Bible says, I believe in verse 19, that everybody is excited. I came to tell you, I'm excited about your future. We don't say that just because it's nice to say. It's a declaration that you and I have to say every day. I'm excited about my future. I know God has it under control and I believe he will do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ask or think God is going to blow your mind. Why? Because he's working it in you. He's working it through you. And I want you to know that the best is yet to come. Do not beat yourself up. I want you to embrace what God has given you. I want you to receive what's happening. I want you to say, God, if you're positioning me for new, let me stay open for new. Don't close yourself off. Make sure you go to the stage and accept what God has for you. Listen, family, I love you. I miss you dearly, and I cannot wait till we can gather again. There are many things happening in our nation, and we're still trying to uh, figure out and strategically position the church where we can continue to meet your needs. And right now, we're having to do a lot of things virtually. So as we walk through this, there will be some changes and some things we're going to do. We're going to try some things, but we're going to do whatever we can to make sure that we are meeting your needs. And I want to thank you for watching today. And I pray that you would share this with someone 
who may be feeling down, who may be feeling like hope is all gone, let them know that Jesus is still there and they cannot beat themselves up during this time. So I want you to, at this time, think about what it is that you want God to do in your life. But for that person who's watching right now that you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat a simple prayer after me. And it goes like this. Heavenly Father, come into my life. I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I pray that you will come into my life. Make me brand new. Take control of my life and allow me to live this new life you have prepared for me. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you got up three days later with all power in your hand. I believe it, and I receive it. In Jesus' name, I'm saved. If you prayed that prayer, it's that simple. And now Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is now in your life. We want you to let us know that you have accepted Christ into your life. If we can pray for you, there's information on the screen right now that you can actually take advantage of to let us know that you have given your life to Christ. We love you and we're praying for you. And now we're going to prepare our hearts to give. Thank you so much for your giving. And I want to continue and to, to push you and encourage you to continue to give because even though we're not gathering, ministry is still going on, believe it or not. Because of your giving, we've been able to raise money to give to Harvest Hope uh, to actually feed almost 200,000 people. We want to continue to do that. We're looking at other ways we can uh, do community service in our community, but because we want to make sure that people are safe, we're trying to provide resources, uh, financial resources to those who are in need. Uh, so listen, we love you guys. Thank you much for believing in the ministry, believing in the vision, and I look forward to seeing what God continues to do. I love you all. I pray you have a wonderful week. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those who are giving now. I pray that you will multiply their seed 30, 60, even 100 fold. And Father, I pray that you continue to bless them because God, we have declared we're not giving where we're living, but we are sowing where we are going. We trust you and we believe in you. Father, I also pray that they have a wonderful week. A blessed week. Keep them safe. Father, even those who are in our midst who have tested positive, I pray for healing and for recovery. We come against death and we speak life even now. We thank you for all you will continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, love you guys. See you soon.